Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of our Saviour. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. This is the word of the Lord. Affirmation. He is the servant of the Lord. 
Well, here we see that Paul claims that title too. Servant of God. He's the one through whom God will carry out his purposes. He's the, he's the instrument of God. And it's simultaneously a, a humble thing and an honourable thing. Right? A servant. Someone whose whole identity is wrapped up with service. And not uh, your, your will before mine. Your desires before mine. Your priorities before mine. But it's also an honourable thing. Servant of God. Bound to the will of the maker of the universe. Directed by the one who made all things. An instrument of God Almighty. But not only is he servant of God, he's also apostle of Jesus Christ. And the word apostle in the New Testament means sent one. He's one who has been sent by someone else. Paul has, has been sent by Jesus Christ. Again, it's a humble thing and an honourable thing. My own thoughts, my words, my deeds, they don't matter. My, my, my aim is to do the will of him who sent me, not my will. And yet it's an honourable thing. Because it's Jesus Christ who he's representing. So, you know, suppose I had a message that I wanted to send to you, um, but you're far away and I, I can't call you, so, so I'm going to choose my apostle, I choose my apostle and I, I send them to you. Perhaps I want to say, wash the dishes, or some other. I, I send my apostle, he's going to go to you, he said, he's going to say, wash the dishes. Okay? Well, whose message is it when you receive it? On the one hand, you can say, yes, yeah, the, the Apostle's message, he came, he said, uh, wash the dishes, he told me that. But, in a sense, it's even truer to say, it's my message. I said it. Um, it's, it's the Apostle's message, but even more so, it's my message. And so it is here with Paul. Paul is Christ's Apostle. He's, he's been commissioned by Christ. And therefore, what he says is what Jesus wants him to say. You see, through these, these two titles, Paul is saying that his words can't be taken lightly. Well, he, he communicates the word of Jesus to the church. So, so when he speaks as, as Christ's representative, you know what Jesus Christ says. When, when Paul has spoken on a subject from Jesus, you can no longer say, what does Jesus think about this? Okay? And, and that's actually and one of the issues um, with, with red letter Bibles, apologies if you have one, um, but yeah, red letter Bibles, it, it makes it seem as though the words that Jesus spoke in his earthly life are the words that are the highest category, the, the ones that are truly Jesus' words. But Paul is Christ's apostle. These are Christ's words. Paul is sent by Christ, the apostle of Christ. And what Paul says is what Jesus would have him say. And therefore, we listen to Paul. Paul's words recorded in the Bible are God's words to us. But to what end has Paul been sent? What's, what's he been sent for? What is the, the central thing uh, that Paul is saying? And as Paul introduced himself, the second thing we see, the last thing we see, um, is that Paul is Christ's apostle to proclaim the gospel for godliness. To proclaim the gospel for godliness. That is why Paul has been sent. That's the reason why he's been made an apostle. That's why he serves God. He proclaims the gospel for godliness. And we begin to see that straight away. So look down again at verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect. The, the reason why Paul has been sent out by Jesus is for his chosen ones, God's chosen ones, the church, to be grown in their faith. So, so here's, here's Jesus sending out Paul, and he's not sending him out aimlessly, just go do what you do. He's not sending him out um, randomly, just, just do what you can. No, he's got an aim, an agenda, a, a directive. This is why I'm sending you, for the sake of the faith of my chosen people. Go strengthen uh, the faith of my people. Go build them up in, in their trust in me. What a high calling. And he goes on. 
for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. <coughs> See, Paul has been sent so that the elect, God's chosen people, might know the truth, might come to know the true gospel, the true message of the salvation that God brings. That is Paul's mission uh, as apostle, is to further the faith of God's elect by proclaiming the gospel. And, and that hasn't stopped. You know, Paul, Paul's died, but we have his testimony. We have scripture, and it's given for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. His, his writings, which the Spirit breathed out through him, God continues to use for us. For the sake of our faith, for the sake of our knowledge of the truth. When Jesus sent Paul, he knew what we need, he knew what SBC needs. He knows we need the gospel. And so reading Paul strengthens our faith because uh, it strengthens our faith in the one who sent him. Not ultimately because of who Paul is, but because of the God who sent him and the gospel that he was given to proclaim. And that gospel, that knowledge of the truth, isn't passive. What I mean is, it isn't just some facts that you learn, it isn't just some information that you have to digest. It too, the gospel, also has a direction, it has an end. It leads to something. So again, verse 1, Paul is a servant of God and apostle of Christ Jesus for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. The knowledge of the truth accords with godliness. The gospel, knowing the gospel, leads to godliness. You see, what you think and what you believe, it, it affects us. Right? Whatever faith you have, um, if it is true faith, it's real faith, if it's, if it's belief in, a, in something that you deeply hold, it cannot but affect your life. It cannot but, but affect the way that you live. And that's actually not just true of our faith. Um, it's, it's true of all faiths, all beliefs, whether they're true or false, whether they're knowledge of the truth or knowledge of lies. So, for example, if someone wrongly believes that in order to be right with God, they need to be slavishly obedient. They need to uh, get right with God by their good works. That God has set their, their standards, and it's their job to, to work and sweat until they reach that standard. If they think that, that will affect their behaviour. They will be a rule keeper, they will be a point scorer, they will struggle to rest and to rejoice and to give thanks. They'll be frustrated when they fail, they'll, they'll look down on others, they'll, they'll be critical. Um, and people that they see as above them, they'll idolise. Or, if someone wrongly believes that God doesn't care what we, what we do with our lives, that he has no interest, well that will affect them. They won't pray. They'll not involve God in their life. They'll, they'll follow their desires. They'll be afraid when they feel in danger because they don't know the care of a loving Father. She believes what you hold in your heart affects practice. Belief affects practice. And practices spring from beliefs. So, what does our faith do? What does our belief do? How does it shape our practice? Well, the knowledge of the truth accords with godliness. It leads to being good. It makes us good. This, this word, godliness, it speaks to a quality of life that's not simply internal. It's actually beautifully behavioural. It's, it's outward. It's good doing. It's visible. And the knowledge of the truth, knowledge of the gospel, accords with godliness. A community that is shaped by the gospel is a community shaped by godliness. A, a church who know the truth live lives that are marked by godliness. Individuals who have faith in God and the true God will, will demonstrate their faith by actions. You see, for Paul, it's, it's inconceivable that there's a wedge in there, that there's a gap. As if you can, you can grow in knowledge of the truth, but continue to persist in godliness, in ungodliness. A, a church that is not growing in godliness is a church that isn't growing in the gospel. A church that 
isn't uh, growing in, in, in becoming good, is a church that, that doesn't uh, know the truth. Individuals who are not growing God in us are individuals who are not growing in faith. See, our faith in God accords with godliness. Our, our knowledge of Him leads to a life transformed into goodness. And so we cling to the gospel. We must root our lives and replace them with gospel truth. And, and I say, knowing this is so helpful when we're fighting sin. Um, we've, we've all had those seasons where it seems like we're doing the same sin again and again and again. And maybe there's an area now that comes to mind you just think, yeah, I'm not good in that area. I'm not godly. And it can be so discouraging. Maybe it's the sort of thing that, you know, when someone asks you, how are you? The first thing you think of is, how, how long has it been since I gave us temptation in that area? Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's harsh words. And you're discouraged and you're disappointed in yourself and you think, why? Why am I doing this? Why again? I said never again. And then I'm doing it again. Now, I'm not saying everything that needs to be said, but the knowledge of truth accords with godliness. So, beneath the surface is a lie, a belief that, that's not true. So, it's easy to see the sin, the thing that you're doing, but underneath the sin, there's a root, and that root is feeding the sin. The root is a lie that, that, that is believed. And so, with prayer and, and reflection and help from elders and mature brothers and sisters in the church, expose the root and then attack it with gospel truth. So maybe it's, maybe it's why am I so prayerless? And, and I confess it and, and I share with my brothers and sisters and they help me by asking questions. You know, what, what is it that you, when you pray, how do you view God? Um, is, he, is he smiling at you or is he frowning? And maybe then there's a lie in me that God's always angry and when I come to him, he's, he's disappointed. And that's a lie, that's the root, and it's exposed, and then, and then you attack the root with the gospel. No, he's your loving father, he delights in you. He, he sent his son because he loves you. As a father shows compassion to his children, so, God, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He will rejoice over you with gladness, he will quiet you by his love, he will exalt over you with singing. So you move from prayerlessness to godly prayerfulness through gospel truth. And maybe, maybe it's a difference in maybe it's you know being harsh, harsh words that come out and you just think, where did that come from? Why am I saying these things? And you do it again and again and again. And so you pray and you confess and you share and you receive counsel. And maybe you, you trace it down and you notice these words come out when when I, when I don't feel in control. These words come out when I, when, when I feel afraid. And, and why, why am I feeling afraid? I'm, I'm afraid because when I think things are not in my control, then things will not be good. Um, and that's a lie. And then you attack it with gospel truth. Yes, your life isn't in your, your control, but it's in the hand of the one who loves you. It's in the, it's in the hand of one who's good. And no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And so you move, you, you have peace, and that, and, that, and that gospel peace moves you from harsh words to kind words through gospel truth. So we're to preach the gospel to ourselves, preach the gospel to one another. We're to be reminded by the apostles, and, and we're to have lives uh, that are of godliness. And if we want that, then it's the gospel that we need to cling to ever more closely, in all its beauty, in all its glory, in all its transforming power. If we're to be good, then we must know deeply, deeply the gospel. And there are so many beautiful ways to characterize the gospel, so many stunning aspects. But, but let's look at what Paul draws out here. It is verse 2, in the hope of eternal life. The hope of eternal life, life without end. Life which is really life. I don't know if you've, you've ever heard someone say that, that life forever would be boring. Or, um, or that eternal life, would, that wouldn't be a good thing. But can I say, if you think that, then you don't know what's on offer here. Life is good. Life is really good. 
And the things in this life which are not good are things which have the flavor of death, things which are, are, are infected by sin and curse. But Paul is talking about eternal life. He's talking about life that isn't prematurely halted by, uh, by death, a life that's not permeated with sin. He's talking about life overflowing from the Father of life. And that life is good. That life will be unimaginably good. And this, this hope isn't wishful thinking, it's not, um, it's not just, just, just dreaming. It's a certain hope. It's hope which, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. It is promised by a God who doesn't lie, who cannot lie, who won't lie, or whom it's impossible to lie. And I wonder if you've reflected recently on, on the certainty of eternal life. You know, things in this life can feel like the realest, the most solid, the most substantial. But for those who know Christ, who have come to a knowledge of the truth, there's a life to come which will make this life feel like a dream. As solid as everything feels now, the, the stuff of our life with Christ in glory will be firmer. We will be without decay, without spoilage, without rot. Eternal life, that's, that's the life that Paul hopes for. And it's the life he, hope, he, he holds out for others to hope for. And that hope also accords with godliness. See, if you know the eternal life that's waiting for you, if you know the life of Jesus that you have forever, then let that fill you and fuel you for godliness. How much of our sin is about best life now? We want to get comfort, we want ease, we want personal glory. We want it now. But attack that with the gospel. Say, no Christian, you have eternal life. God has prepared eternal life for you from before the foundation of the world. This isn't it. This isn't it. Look ahead, trust and rest. And with confidence in that eternal life prepared for you, be godly, love deeply from the heart, give sacrificially, serve joyfully, live in purity, all springing from the hope of eternal life. See, in, in the hope of eternal life, we together, as a church, can, can look forward. We can, we can become a church which carries one another's burdens in which relationships are characterized by honesty and openness and, and joy and self-control, in which there's, there's real deep intergenerational love, in which saints are quick to serve. And the, the, the knowledge of the truth, the hope of eternal life, leads to that. It leads to godliness. It leads to godliness and empowers godliness. And as Paul speaks of this eternal life promise, I hope that you can see his, his bubbling joy in the role that he has in it. So from verse 2, in, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word, through the pe preaching with which I have been entrusted, through the command of God our Saviour, for, for the sake of the faith of God's elect, and their knowledge of the truth, proclaiming the hope of eternal life. That's Paul's role. He gets to be entrusted with that message. Me? Me, Lord? Our Saviour, the one who sent his son to die for us, wants me to proclaim that message? Commanding me to give this message, the message that gives power to live a godly life? That's what Paul is about. That's his heart. That's his mission. That's the thing for which he's been sent as an apostle. Hope-giving, faith-building, truth-telling. Paul is Christ's apostle to proclaim the gospel for godliness. <clears throat> so let's hold fast to scripture, let's, let's know the gospel, enjoy the gospel, see the gospel. And, and let me end as, as Paul does here with, with words that we skip over so often. And verse 4, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. See so if you're here, there may be some here who, who don't know this eternal life. It's not your... It's not your promise yet. And yet it can be. It can be. Jesus Christ died to take the punishment for our sin. And he rose again to new life. So that if you believe in him, this life can be yours. This eternal life can be yours. That's what we can have. Grace. God's undeserved favour. 
peace, good relationship with God on the basis of the salvation that Christ Jesus brings. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that we can receive grace and peace from you. And we pray, Lord, that you would take this gospel knowledge to its natural end, that we would be godly, that we would be transformed into your image. And we pray this for the, for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.